and uh, I quickly uh, considered and then rejected as problematic as the word I use, returning to LaGuardia. I just wasn't sure I could do it. And I needed to be sure I could do it before I chose that because it would have been an, an irrevocable choice. Turning toward LaGuardia, back across the Bronx, back across all that development, uh, would have ruled out every other option. And had we not made LaGuardia, had we missed it even by a few feet, with runway 13 and runway 22 being extensions on piers of landfill over Flushing Bay, I could just envision in a visual, conceptual way what that would have looked like, felt like, been like for, for not only the occupants of the aircraft, but for people possibly on the ground. The next option, of course, was Teterboro. And I couldn't see the runways, but I knew where it was. I knew I could see the area where it must have been. And after some discussion about that, I looked in the windscreen and I saw that area rising in the windscreen. A sure sign that our flight path would intersect the surface of our planet prior to that point. <laughs> and um, you're not just left the only viable option. The only place in metropolitan New York that was long enough, wide enough, smooth enough within our glide range to land an airliner was the Hudson. And so that's the choice that we made. And Jeff told me later that we, he was happy with that choice. Are you, you were okay with that choice? <laughs> yeah, you know, it worked out. <laughs> you know, one of, the, uh, one, of the question, one of the many questions that was asked during one of the interviews, I think, maybe, I forget, 60 minutes. No, there were a lot of them, a lot of questions. Was, what would you do differently? And I like Jeff's answer. He said, I would have done it in July. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh, that didn't make it on the show, by the way. <laughs> uh, but uh, then it was just a matter of uh, continuing to try to, to get through this the, uh, challenge and response step by step portion of the checklist still trying to, to get some usable thrust out of the engines prior to uh, running out of airspeed, altitude, and ideas all at the same time, which is what we ultimately did, and we had to land in the river. And then, of course, as, my, as, as we lost altitude and we got closer to landing, my focus necessarily had to narrow until ultimately it was just looking at the picture outside the forward windscreen and then looking at the airspeed tape on the, on the PFD. The, the, uh, primary flight display. So outside, inside, outside, inside as we were descending. It was a completely visual maneuver. I was uh, descending much more rapidly with, without usable thrust than for a normal landing. And uh, I had to choose the right height at which to begin the flare. I knew that I only had so much energy, so much kinetic energy to use to trade airspeed for, for a reduced rate of descent. And then if I began the flare too early, we ran the risk of running out of airspeed and dropping it in. If I began the flare too late, we wouldn't have had a chance to reduce our rate of descent. We might have compromised the, the integrity of the, the structure and maybe injured people during the, the touchdown. But I began my flare and pulled further out and further out until I was at full apt side stick and held it, and then we touched. And uh, we scooted along the surface of the Hudson, and when we came to a stop, after the plane had bobbed back down and then come back up, we both turned to each other and at almost the same instant, and almost, the, almost in unison, we said, well, that wasn't as bad as I thought. <laughs> that, that's true, it uh, could have been a lot worse. <laughs> Although, you know, uh, right before we touched down, I got a lot of heat over this, but right before we touched down, it's a, we didn't even know this till we listened to Cockpit Force Recorder. Sully so says, got any other ideas? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, actually not. <laughs> and you know, 
Paul Sully avoids reporters. I'm on the Government Affairs Committee for my uh, Pilots Association, so I want to talk to reporters, and they all have my cell phone number. So uh, at the day of the NTSB hearing in June, when they gave, when they let out the uh, the transcripts, the published transcripts of the Cockpit Force Report tapes, my cell phone started ringing off the hook from reporters. You know, wanted to know, were you just joking around up there in the cockpit? You know, before you, I said, no, we were not joking around in the cockpit before we ditched the airplane in Hudson River. I had to just you know, put out some fires there for a while. No, actually, it, it, uh, it was a serious question. It was, I think, a lot of what we did that day has its uh, genesis in CRM and crew resource management. Um, I actually happen to be one of the people who, along with some other people who are here today in the audience, were involved with the development and the implementation of the crew resource management course that we used at US Airways beginning in the early 90s. And uh, it's, it's a multidisciplinary way of improving the crew performance taking a collection of individuals and quickly forming a team and making them as effective as they can be on the very first leg that they fly together, as effective as they would naturally have been after working together for a long time. It's about leadership and communication and error management and a, a variety of things. And so it was my way of my last ditch effort of saying to Jeff, have we done everything that we needed to do? Is there anything we've overlooked? Is there any other possible action we could take? And I think the answer was no. And we had literally, as the old saying goes, run out of bare speed, altitude, and ideas. We've done everything we could do. Well, that's, uh, that's true. And uh, you know, after we touched down, we, for some reason we lost all power, all electrical power on the airplane. Uh, I still think they don't know why that happened. Uh, but uh, Sully had to hop up to command the evacuation, and uh, I was doing an evacuation checklist up in the cockpit. So uh, Sully went back and was helping the flight attendants get the doors open. The flight attendants did not know that we were landing on the water until they opened the doors and saw water out there. Because uh, the, only, uh, the only communication we had time to give them was that Sully gave them the brace for impact command. Uh, probably a minute or so before we actually touched down. So they had no idea what to expect. But, you know, when I went back, the first thing I was presented with, uh, by this time, first class was empty. You know, as you probably heard that joke, the first class passengers, they didn't even get wet. You know, so that first class pass ticket is worth something. <laughs> you know, the first seven or eight rows of coach were empty. And there's this guy running up, you know, he's maybe 25 years old, he's wearing nothing but boxer shorts and sweat socks. <laughs> he hadn't been dressed that way when he boarded. <laughs> well, we don't know that. <laughs> but apparently he had decided he was going to swim to shore, and that's what you do in the movies, right? You take off all your clothes. I don't know where he did it. But uh, we do consider ourselves extremely fortunate that he kept the boxer shorts on. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we had a great flight attendant crew, Donna Dent, Sheila Dale, and Doreen Welsh. We, uh, we didn't have time to give them all the information that we normally would in an emergency. And I, uh, I actually agonized for a few seconds, because that's all I had, over how to make that announcement. And I chose my words very carefully. But I felt like my highest priority at that point, right before we landed, was to prevent injuries during the touchdown. So I wanted to say brace and not much else. I didn't want to have them looking for life vests under their seat instead of bracing. That's why I didn't tell them that they were in the water and, uh, and they didn't know. And so I can't tell you how difficult it must have been for the flight attendants to be thrown into a situation suddenly, not having a clear understanding of it, and yet turning immediately to their training. And uh, I want to tell you also, uh, I left out a little part here that is important. Uh, I did make about a minute before touchdown the, the announcement, this is the captain brace for impact. 